Hey guys, this is John, and I'm playing Nisu Ak in a 10-minute game on chess.com. Unusual time control for me. I don't normally play 10-minute. Uh, I'm really tempted to play a King's Gambit, but I don't want to make myself think that much in the opening. <laughs> so let's play an Italian game and see what we get. Okay. You know what? I'm sort of in the mood to Gambit something. It wasn't a King's Gambit, but I'll make you Evans Gambit practitioners happy with this opening. So 10 minute, interesting time control. I've had some requests for it. I know a lot of you guys play it and I have some students who play it. I think it's a decent time control if you're looking to get games in and don't have like a ton of time to commit to say 30 minutes or longer, you still get a pretty good bang for your time invested. But just know that the quality of games is gonna be somewhat poor, especially with no increment compared to the 15 plus 10 games uh, doesn't seem like that much of a bump, but it is, or especially the 30 minute games are longer. Okay. Knight of six. So I've given up a pawn here. Uh, I actually wonder if I should take on E5 playing D5 and playing queen A4 check is tempting too, but he can meet that with C6 at all times. And I don't think that leads anywhere. I think I might've missed my chance to, uh, play queen B3 already, but I'm going to play bishop G5 and pin the knight and see how he responds. Of course, in yapping, I already get behind a little bit on the clock. So let's try to make up for this. If he plays h6, I'm actually thinking of playing bishop h4, g5, knight takes g5. It's a pretty radical decision, but given that his bishop is over here, it looks very interesting because this knight will be pinned. I can perhaps put pressure on it with queen f3 or maybe even f4 in the future. I'm just quite curious to see how he'll respond to this. And I always have if h6, uh, bishop h4 g5. I have the backup move bishop g3 if I really want to play that way, although I'd prefer not to. I should also mention on the previous move I could have captured on e5 and tried to win the f7 pawn, but I don't believe that should lead to anything as white. Yeah, I think, in fact, castles on move 7 was a little bit inaccurate, but I'm not a huge Evans Gambit guy, so I'm learning as I go. Okay, so bishop b6, solid move, often played in these positions. Again, I could take on e5 if I want. It actually makes a little more sense here compared to before. He has wasted a tempo with bishop b6. Probably will get a trade, then I'll get to take on e5. That just might be the best option. I don't see how else I'm going to effectively put pressure on his position. Yeah, let's take. I'm not thrilled about this, but let's see what he does. Probably take with the pawn. If he takes with the knight, then I can trade. Trade queens on d8 and take on f7 is the plan. And I think I'll have a little bit of pressure there with this knight still being pinned. It does stick with the knight, okay. So this is his idea after that to play h6, because then I might have a slight structural advantage, at least it seems to me. Okay, so let's not think about it too long. I can't play bishop takes f7 here because I'm not uh, winning his queen. His rook would be defending his queen. That is a tactic you want to look at, though. Bishop takes f7 to deflect the king. Okay, so he plays king here. Probably bishop back to b3 is most logical. Yeah. So now at least his king is kind of caught in the center. If h6, I might play bishop h4. And if g5, bishop g3, I'll be hitting e5. So he just develops. I'm going to do the same. Let's just complete my development here. So normally with the queens off the board he wouldn't be that concerned with his king in the center. But I wonder if I can pressure this king. Okay, so here, yeah, I could take f6 and take e6 and maybe try to use some of the light squares, but it's much more appealing to me to keep pressure on. So let's, let's do this. e4 is even guarded by my knight, so I'm definitely not worried about g5, but keeping this pin is pretty appealing. Might cause him to burn a tempo later, king f7. Uh, and I can potentially just go after this pawn on e5, ask him how he's going to defend it. I have some weaknesses in my own position, definitely. You know, by virtue of playing b4 on move 4, 
my A pawn and my C pawn are separated. They're both isolated. But for the moment, E5 looks like more of a weakness. And he does play G5. I'm a little surprised by that. Okay. So we'll do this. Rook D8. Okay. So he hits my knight. He's trying to bring a piece into the game with a gain of time. Now, I could move the knight here to attack E5. But then he does take on E4. I could take E5. He takes G3. I don't think checking on g6 really leads to anything. Looks better to just defend my knight here as opposed to moving it. Leaning in that direction. Yeah, let's... Let's do this one. I want to keep this rook here just in case later I want to play f4. That's the plan. Okay, still a little bit behind on the clock. Nothing major, though. We're on move 17. Hmm. Captures. Probably take with the pawn. Keep this threat alive. Okay, and he just moves his king up. Yep, makes sense. So maybe rook here now, prepping knight c4. That doesn't really prep it, though, because he can trade on e1. Mm, not sure I'm thrilled about that. Hmm. Yeah, king e6 is a good move. Takes the sting out of my knight jumps, too. Just a good move. It'd be really nice to play f3. If I could, but that's not going to happen. And I think I got to do something fast before he moves his rook down to d3, let's say. I mean, maybe I can play knight c4, and if knight takes e4, rook e1. But somehow it looks kind of wrong. But I think I got to play this move, so I'm not going to deliberate any longer. Yeah, take and then here is kind of interesting. And if knight takes g3, I can insert rook takes e5. My knight is actually pretty stable. But I don't think I'm any better in that resulting position. It's probably just about equal. But yeah, a good tip is if you see only one move in the position, it looks forced to you, you should just play it. Okay, knight takes e4. So now, fairly big decision by me. Because I can take on e5 with the bishop, but... Then he takes on d1 and f2 is loose. I don't like the look of that. So yeah, I'm, I'm leaning towards this move. Knight takes g3, rook takes e5, king f6. I can't take with the f pawn. I have to take with the h pawn. My knight is stable. Yeah, I think I'm going to do that. I could also trade and play rook e1, but that's not as good. I'd rather keep both rooks on board. Let's do that. Note, he definitely doesn't want to take on c3 here, because I have bishop takes e5, hitting the rook and also the knight. So I'm under five minutes now, nothing too bad, nothing I really have to worry about quite yet. Okay, so let's proceed as planned, and he does play king f6, I gotta take here. Now, if rook d3, I'm thinking double the rooks and maybe give him this pawn and try to go for some checks. I don't think I have a mating net per se. Yeah, and he just plays it safe safe and plays his rook there. That makes sense. This is going to be tough to do much. Trade and take on b6 might be my best bet, or trade and play rook. Yeah, I think start with a trade for sure. And now rook d1, perhaps. I'm holding this bishop hostage so, I, hostage, so I don't necessarily have to take it yet. Although he could play bishop c5 and maybe get away, but then I play b4. That might actually be a bit better for me. Let's try to... Let's try to gain something by keeping the knight for the moment. I mean, his bishop for the moment is only useful in attacking f2. So if I can just preserve the option of taking... Okay, now I might have to take... But he's allowing me to invade with the rook after this. 
just quickly seeing if there's any alternatives to taking. I don't think so. I think I got to do it. And now come in with the rook, probably. You want to play actively in these positions, definitely. And he comes back. Okay. So he says, I'm not afraid of the pawn ending. Now, interestingly, I can make a pass pawn quicker than he can. And he offers a draw. I can make a pass pawn right away if I trade. So take, take, f4. And I can shut him down over here. I mean, that's that's like a free roll situation for me. I think I should take him up on that. I mean, if I keep the rooks on the board, he has no problem, especially with this king in the center. I'm going to try it. I'm going to go for this. So my king can come up here, here, real quick. Yeah, I have a pass pawn already. It's If he takes, even better. It's undoubled. I get to undouble my g-pawn, so he probably won't take. Let's bring the king up. The only question is if he can somehow out-tempo me favorably in a position, but I don't think so. I think... He's going to get forced back. So I'm really banking on the fact that I have this pass pawn, and he does not have a pass pawn in sight. Despite having a majority over here, he can't force one with three versus two. Probably needs to do something with h5. I think that's his only chance, actually. to stop me from playing g4, uh, or maybe even king up to g4. If we get in a situation, he takes. Wow, I think that is wrong. Okay, king f3, he's going to play h5 now, but still it feels wrong. Unless he's going to try to take my g-pawn at some moment. G3, okay, yeah, so he's going to out-tempo me over there. There's no question about that. So do I play king e3? Yeah, probably king e3. Probably just want to wait with my king, actually. Or king f3 and then king e3. Okay, let's play king f3. I don't have a ton of time, so I'm just going to play by instinct. He's got to play h5 now. And I think I'm just going to wait now. Yeah, let's wait with the king. If he plays h4, I can go here, followed by an eventual g4. I want to get into this square with my king. Eventually make him move from f5. He goes there voluntarily. But now g4 check is a pretty big threat, I think. Yeah, let's play this right away. King e4, king here. This pawn's going to promote. I think he's too slow. Let's go here. If he pushes, I will take. Pushes the b-pawn, I will take. Is that winning? Ugh, that, hmm, that's a tough call, actually. If he pushes, I can also play c4, but I'm a little worried about b5. Tricky. Yeah, he's going to try that. that. That might be his only chance. Okay, if I take and then king e3, he's going to go back... Eventually I can win his pawn, but I might not win that end game. Mm. Take king e3, he goes back. I think that is winning. I, I'm not completely sure. So now he should definitely play king f6, I think. I think I can make him start burning his tempo sooner or later. And my pawn being back on b3 could help. So I'm envisioning a position where his king is on f8. Okay, he's going to burn the tempi immediately, but that helps. I was envisioning a position with his king on f8, my pawn on f7, my king on f6 or e6. And he has to start moving his pawns. So yeah, paradoxically, I think moving these pawns is bad for him. 
King d5, King f5, King here, takes, takes, here, here. King d5 here, here. Actually, King d5 here, here, take, take, here, here, take. Hmm. No, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to play it safe. I only have one minute left, so probably better to play it like this. Yeah, and now come over. And winning position. My king has reached the key square. So even though technically he had the opposition there with the king on b6, king on b8, once her king reaches the key square, it's over. And I'm promoting the pawn. That was instructive. I did not play the opening well. I think I let any sort of advantage slip that I could hope for out of the Evans Gambit there. Probably by taking on e5. I mean, I think he was probably just fine in the resulting position. But that was quite instructive insofar as transitioning to the end game. So I'm going to be curious to look at this because, yeah, you got to be very careful about that. Pawn end games are the clearest type of end games. Even then, they can be very complicated. But offering to go into a pawn end game is a permanent thing. So when he played rook e7, it's, it comes down to calculation and judgment. Um, a lot of a judgment in this case because I didn't have much time. But the fact that I have a pass pawn already and he has difficulty creating a pass pawn on this wing, especially without being able to use his king, I think means this is probably a winning position for me. Just the last difficulty was right here. I was contemplating what happens if he keeps the pawn on b7. So you know what? I'm going to pull up a different window here just so I can get to more analysis tools. And we're going to take a look at this. OK. So Evans Gambit, b4, white sacrificing a pawn in order to gain some time, play c3. And bishop a5 is one of the best moves here. There's also bishop e7. And I'm not too familiar with the theory. This has never been a fixture in my repertoire for white. Um, Maybe I was confusing lines, actually, because I know in the bishop e7 variation, black actually does this as well. So d6. So I, I was hesitant to take on e5. I could do that if I want to try to win the pawn back. Let's say take, kind of similar to the game, take. But I think black can take with the knight or even the king. I don't see that being an issue. d5 is a move I definitely should have looked at here. I didn't really notice it until the next move, but I don't think it wins material. d5 followed by queen a4 check. Hitting the king and also the bishop, but I think he can just play c6 and he should just be fine here. Unless I'm missing something. I don't think pressure against f7 is going to amount to anything. Yeah, queen defending the bishop. I don't see what to do here. So this this might be the moment to play queen b3, which is a motif, a big motif for white in the Evans Gambit. Load up against f7. Because now he hasn't developed his knight, so he can't just can't he can't just castle and defend the, the pawn on f7. And if knight h6, I can take on h6, remove the defender. So it looks like he's going to be forced to play one of these moves to defend. Uh, maybe queen f6, but actually queen f6, I can probably play d5. Because then when the knight is driven away and, away and I play check or queen b5, there's going to be no queen on d8 to defend the bishop. So for, ex for example, like this. Previously, the queen was defending the bishop here, but not so this time around. So yeah, queen b3, I think, is definitely the move here. I just played too routinely with castles. Yeah, this is looking good. I mean, if he plays queen d7, which looks very awkward. I mean, it blocks the bishop. If he plays queen d7, I don't think even here I can just outright win material. d5, knight d8. It'd be nice to play this, but he has c6. And notice I don't have a check here, here, because the queen is blocking. I feel like this might be some theory, but again, I'm not completely sure about it. Got to look this up. 
So d6, I castled, he played knight f6, and yeah, now a big difference is if I play queen b3, he can just calmly castle. Anytime, if you're black in these e4, e5 situations, and your opponent's ganging up on f7, usually with a bishop here and also another piece, even the knight on g5, in particular the knight on g5, if you can castle and defend f7, that's usually a good thing. I mean, I could even crank up the pressure for a move, but it doesn't look like it's going to amount to anything here. Queen e7 is fine. So... Yeah, I played bishop g5, and he put the bishop solidly back on b6. Why don't I just turn on the engine here, because it would be good to get the engine's take on a couple positions. Oh, I see that messed up my screen capture. That's a shame. Well, I'm going to refer to the engine only when I have to then, because I do recommend looking at the engine, but only sparingly. <laughs> only after you've made some conclusions on your own. So we'll add that maybe as a last little check. So bishop g5, bishop b6, and now I took on e5 because I just didn't see anything better. I did mention I had this idea if black plays h6 here to play bishop h4, keep the pin, g5, and maybe this. This might be unsound. I mean, I wouldn't doubt it at all if the computer disapproved of this, but this pressure on f6 looks real annoying. You know, in faster games, you might make decisions... Uh, that you wouldn't necessarily make in a longer time control game or you would make with a lot more thought in a long time control game. Especially if you can put your, your opponent under pressure, it may be good to play a sacrifice that is potentially speculative according to the computer. But if you're not investing that much material, it can be a good bet in a rapid game. So, you know, I give up one point of material with this operation. I'm now down two points of material because I still haven't got my pawn that I sacrificed back. I have nothing to show for that. But this looks annoying for black. The knight's on, F, on f6 is pinned. There's queen f3 in the air. There's also a long-term idea of playing king h1 and f4. He may have some counterplay against my king. He has a rook down the h-file. But the reason why I like this here, as opposed to uh, normal, let's say, e4, e5 situations, is the bishop is all the way over here on a5, the dark square bishop for black. If black had a bishop on e7, I wouldn't do that because he'd be breaking the pin. But... In this resulting position, it's not easy for black to get out of this pin here. That knight is constantly stuck on the f6 square. So, could be speculative, but something I was thinking about. Instead, he played bishop b6. Yeah, solid move. It just puts pressure on d4. It interferes with my ability to, to develop with knight bd2, if I ever want to put my knight there, because he might just take, and he's got two defenders. So... Yeah, also d5 followed by queen a4 check is not really working anymore. So I took on e5. I decided at this point just to get my pawn back. I thought he would actually take this way. And then after the trade of queens, take with the knight and maybe try to play this position, perhaps bishop e6. This also looks completely fine for him. I think he's enjoying a pretty nice position. Maybe I can do this and then take, but he looks very active here. I like this dark square bishop. These pawns are a weakness. He does have double isolated f pawns, but I think I think Black is doing fine in something like this. But I think the way he played it too is also okay. I was just a little more surprised by this as opposed to d takes. So knight takes, pawn takes, queen takes d8, king takes d8. Again, as I was saying, bishop takes f7 is a move you gotta look at in these situations to deflect the king from guarding the queen, but he takes and I'm not winning the queen. This would work great if there was a piece in the way, like a bishop on f8 or something, but not so here. So I do the other move order, take, and then bishop takes f7. King e7. I think these next several moves for both sides are pretty logical. I just retreat my attack bishop. He completes his development. I go here so that if he takes me, I have the option of taking with the pawn, as happened in the game, straightening out my structure, also completing my development. Thought for a second about taking here, you know, maybe playing a position like this. If I could get my knight to f5 quickly, I think I would like this a little more, but that's really my only idea in the position. And it feels like he was going to get on the file pretty fast, you know, something like this. I don't think I'm at all better, so I might have to try to contest the file. And again, this doesn't seem like really much I'm working with. Although arguably I could could do this. I mean, I might I might have the time to pull it off here sink the knight in and slowly try to improve the position maybe get out of the pin here but it does it looks really thin so i kept the bishop i played bishop h4 he went ahead and played g5 
drop back, rook d8, rook d1. In view of what happening, I'm trying to think if it's better to use the other rook. Probably not. The only advantage of playing this is that in the event of a trade, my rook would be operating on this file, but that's not really relevant unless I get rid of the bishop, even if all that happens. And I go here and take his bishop. He can probably still take with the A pawn. I mean, given that I played rook e1, eh, yeah, I don't, I don't think rook fd1 is the right rook. So rook ad1. I think it's more likely that this rook will be good on the e1 square, or maybe in some cases down the f file, if I can escape this pin situation. And I think he played this accurately. Takes. I wasn't quite expecting that, but it makes a lot of sense in hindsight. I took with a pawn. And now king up. Simply king up, making way for the king now that he's traded the bishop. It's no longer occupying e6, so march up with the king. And I felt like I had to do something right away because rook d3 is a very big idea in the position for him. Infiltrating, getting ready to double, attacking c3. g3 could also be loose in some cases because remember that f2 pawn is pinned. So I didn't like the fact that my knight was just sitting here preventing my rook from contesting his rook on d8. So I move the knight, but in doing so, I do leave e4 undefended. So here, and I might have to be accurate at this point. I mean, I feel like if I... If I play something like this, let's say, which I think I mentioned in the game, he's probably already winning material. He can play rook takes d1. If I take back, at minimum, he can take on f2 with check. He might be able to move the rook first too, but like, let's say bishop takes f2, king f1, uh, rook f8. I don't think I have anything to show for the pawn, and I'm facing even more threats with the discovery with the bishop. So probably just down a pawn here. Um... Rook takes d1. Note that bishop takes h8 is not going to work because he has bishop takes f2. My rook is pinned. I can't legally capture. So I'm getting mated in this case. So yeah, this is where my chess sense of danger was kicking in. And I was saying to myself, John, you got to do something. You might be worse here. You got to do something to try to hold the balance in this position. Forget looking for an advantage yourself. But rook d3 is coming. Knight c4. Honestly, seems like one of the only moves here. I could maybe consider knight f3 as well, but knight f3 has no advantage over knight c4, in my opinion, because I am hitting e5, but I'm not hitting b6. It's really handy to hit that bishop on b6, too. So knight c4, he takes. Yeah, and now I go here. It would also be interesting for him to take first and only then play knight takes e4. This might be similar to the game, though. Rook e1. Ah, it is a little different though. Like he could potentially play rook d8 here and take advantage of the weak back rank. I can't play this because rook d1 check. And I get back rank mated. That is interesting. So maybe he jumped the gun here with taking on e4. Maybe he should trade on d1 first and then take. Hard to say because, yeah, if I play bishop takes e5, this transposes to that line that I mentioned was not good take here rook f8 maybe i can take b6 maybe here i can do this and then try for rook e1 like i don't have time though because he just takes on g3 he can maybe even take g3 here but this this is probably simple enough he's just going to be up a pawn mm, yeah rook takes d1 is looking more accurate for him take take here Trying to think of any way I can cause some problems here. Well, okay, the critical move is probably still rookie one, but as I mentioned, the fact that he has this move is really annoying. Can I get away with this? Looks dangerous. <laughs> I'm playing with fire. My knight's defended. If he takes, I take here. I'm threatening discoveries. This is probably fine, but maybe he doesn't take. Maybe he plays rook in here. Cranks up the pressure on f2. I guess I have this move, though. Ooh, it's complicated. Maybe not so bad for me. If this is the exact position, he actually loses material. Funnily enough. Hmm. Yeah, that line is worth exploring more, though. I think the move order matters a lot here. If Black's going to have something, he probably needs a precise move order. He takes, and I go here. It just felt better to keep a pair of rooks on board, because... Uh, as happened in the game, so after this, 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 and takes. 
It's just really nice that I don't have to worry about rook d1 check. It's something like bishop takes f2. Yeah, and that sequence was pretty forced. Note that if he takes on c3, he's running into trouble after bishop takes e5 with the double attack and all the discoveries. Just losing material again. So this all makes sense. Here, take... I think this is just level, to be honest. Plays rook e8. I was also wondering about this move, which is a double attack. He's threatening rook takes g3 and rook takes c3. Note that this move is possible uh, with his bishop here, although... Yeah, I could take the bishop. I might leave my rook undefended. I didn't have a lot of time to calculate this, but I was thinking rook here. Just pitch one of the pawns. Now he definitely can't take that pawn because I take here and this rook is even defended. So once he takes back, I take his rook on g3. So probably the critical move would be takes, but I mean, I can check. I probably at minimum have a draw here. Maybe even a mate. I was trying to see if something like this led to a checkmate. I don't know if... Most rational players playing black would even want to allow this. It actually looks like I'm really close to mating. Check. If king f5, g4 is a nice mate. So king here is forced. I can make him walk up. I can't play g3 because he takes with the rook. But it's it's very close to mate. I don't, don't think he'd want to do this. Maybe I can do this. And then here and threaten g3. Yeah, he's probably losing here. So I think it makes sense he didn't go for that, but that's just one line I considered where I might be able to get some counterplay. So he takes away any attacking aspirations I have down the e-file by playing rook e8. Still, I think, logical play by black. I trade. And now this idea of holding the bishop hostage, I think, is a useful one because a lot of times people trade knights for bishops at the earliest opportunity because the more advanced players among you may have even heard before or even seen it play out in your own games, that a lot of times you should prefer bishops to knights ever so slightly. I mean, there's a reason why the bishop pair is so revered in chess. But that doesn't mean that you should automatically take a bishop with a knight just when you can. You might be able to effectively hold off on that capture. Uh, so I refer to this as holding the bishop hostage. It happens more so when the bishop is on the edge of the board, like strictly on the edge with on the rook file. But... This is one case where I think I don't have to play knight takes b6 right away, even though the bishop is on um, a square where it could escape. It could go to c5. I played rook d1 here. I figured if bishop c5, it might be good to play uh, b4. I think was the move I was considering. Try to drive the bishop back to one of these squares, neither of which looks so great for black. I mean, even here, black's probably okay. They, they do have a king that's pretty close to the center. But it looks like black might have a couple problems to solve with my knight potentially jumping around or the rook coming in. So he preferred activity. He played rook e2, but I don't think that's correct in view of what happened. He should probably just play a solid move like rook e7. Rook e7 makes a lot of sense, just guarding the seventh rank. Given that I want to get my rook down here and try to attack this row of pawns. So yeah, if he plays rook e7, maybe I persist in this holding the bishop hostage idea b4. Looks like a pretty good move. Just take away bishop c5, but... Again, it's, it's not a whole lot I'm working with. Majorities for the respective sides on opposite sides of the board. I've got a 3 versus 2 on the king side. He has a 3 versus 2 on the queen side. He has a nominally slightly better pawn structure because I have double pawns here. But on the balance, I, I don't think this is going to be much for white. But he plays rookie 2, going for activity, the attack against the f-pawn. I take. So now I think I need to. Too much pressure on f2. Take. Note if he takes this way, then I can consider rook d6. I can consider this. Although actually, hmm. Now that I think about it, this might be just a much better option for him compared to the game. Because the big difference is, with this pawn structure, he can actually hope for a pass pawn. If he plays b5, a5, a4, that's a pass pawn. So if we play down a similar line, this variation and then f4 well i might i may just lose here well okay he should probably play b5 first just to discourage c4 my king is pretty far away i don't know if this is losing but yeah the fact that he can create a competing pass pawn is alarming and if i play this he can play b6 and he's still going to create one 
Hmm. Yeah, that's paradoxical. Taking with the C pawn rather than the A pawn, because almost always you'd want to take with the A pawn towards the center, but yeah, especially in view of what happened, maybe it's the wrong call. Very interesting. So he took with the A pawn. I played rook e7. Yeah, now this is a pivotal moment in the game. So he, he played rook e7, and he played it almost immediately. But as I said, that's a very committal move, because there's no coming back from that pawn end game. Now, even if he's going to play rook e7, he might want to throw in a check first, just to drive my king to the edge of the board, and then play this. Then if we get this, f4. May not make much of a difference, but maybe... Mm, g4 cages my king, but I guess I can come back around, no problem. It just seems like there's other moves he should definitely consider. I mean, rook e7's committal. He doesn't have to play it. He could try for activity. He could try to play, let's say, something like this. And in the style of the Caruana Carlson World Championship, where they had a bunch of 3 plus 2 rook end games, a 3 versus 2 rook end games, rather, something like this could happen, where I do win a pawn, but... The position is a draw. <laughs> I would try to play this out for a while, but black should draw without too many problems. That might be his best bet at this point. Just agree to play down a pawn, or again, throw in the check, and then do all of this. Uh, let's say rook here. I guess I could play b4 if I want to try to keep more tension. The idea if he goes after that, I take... Uh, even, even a position like this is going to be pretty tough to win, though. Although, actually, in this case, I, I go up two pawns. I should be careful with what I'm saying, because going up two pawns like this would be a win. Especially with my ability to create a passed F pawn as well at some stage. Okay, so not simple, but he did have that option of trying to keep the pawns on, uh, trying to keep the rooks on the board, and maybe even giving up a pawn, but looking for counterplay. And there's other lines that are possible here, like c5, perhaps. That might be a decent line, too. Or, if we want to be really accurate, once again, check king h2, rook b1, then c5, uh, b4, c5. I guess I have check here, and then take here. Okay, yeah, yeah, his work's not over. That's, that's bad. This is b7. Yeah, you know what? The more I look at this, the more I think he should take with the C-pawn. That would be my uh, assessment in this position. It's weird. See, again, not normally the thing you would do. And it even leaves him more vulnerable along the 7th rank. Although I guess I'm attacking an equivalent number of pawns, two pawns. It's just the B and the A-pawn instead of the C and the B-pawn. But yeah, I mean, the fact that he can create an outside pass pawn is pretty compelling. The pawn end games might be fine for him, if not better in some cases, if my king's too far away. Yeah, especially if this happens, throws in that, that check again, that in-between check. Don't forget about those in-between moves, guys. Here, let's say this happens. Well, now I definitely have to do this because my king is about as far away as possible from the A file. Very interesting. Okay, so let's get to the relevant pawn end game. Uh, I am just going to throw the computer on here because I think this endgame is winning. But I'm just curious what the engine says. And I know that throws the board off slightly, so I won't keep that on forever. Okay, the engine is... Oh no, I think I know what I can do. Okay, I can do that. That's better. Just doesn't have the evaluation bar. Okay, the engine is nonplussed. <laughs> The engine is not impressed with my assessment that this position is winning. But let's play it out and see. So f4. Engine says just straight zeros across. So it, it evidently thinks that black can hold this. Yeah, taking on f4 doesn't make sense. Now the eval goes up. So this, I know this is very tiny for you guys. I'm sorry about that. Uh, this is plus one and a half now. Okay, let's just say for the sake of argument that we play out that the engine's top line b5. I'd probably play king f3. Now the engine wants to go king f7. Not really sure about that. Okay, let's say come up with the king. King f6, just waiting. Hmm. So I guess what the engine is saying is that it's going to keep the tension 
Because if I take, I don't have a pass pawn anymore, and I still have these pawns here. Keep the tension. And if my king gets too frisky going after these pawns, then black has the option of taking and playing king f5. Okay, so let's just play a few more moves. Uh, b4, engine says c6. Yeah, I guess I'm running out of good moves to make here. And I could play f5, but he'll play h5 then. If something like this happens, I think I just lose, because I'm unable to protect the pawn on e4. I have no spare pawn moves left. I have to move my king, and then black can take here. Okay, so actually, it could be a tempe situation. c6. Come back with the king. King f3. Black just waits. Yeah, king g6. King e4. King f6. Hmm. Okay. So the pawn endgame... Probably not winning when we first get into it, but I think taking on f4 tips it in white's favor. Taking on f4 is a serious mistake. I thought my task was already almost accomplished as far as winning this pawn endgame just because I had a pass pawn and he didn't. But yeah, the engine just demonstrated with that last line that that may not be the case. Play some moves here, stick, stick around with the king, and just wait. And say, what are you going to do about it, white? If you want to push your f pawn, then... You have to reckon with the fact that you run out of moves. You're going to regret that. Yeah, so white is kind of hurt by the fact that I don't have very many spare pawn moves to wait with here. Yeah, and I never want to take. If I if I ever take, that's just awful because these pawns are ineffective. Yeah, I never have time to go win these pawns. I can't really push these guys. Hmm, okay. Yeah, I, I agree with that assessment. But let's just see if after this trade, black is truly busted. Because now, I would be kind of surprised if black can hold this. Because now, the thing is, I have more spare waiting moves available because it's easier to wait with my king. And in many cases, I can use my king aggressively. And if black attacks the pawn, I think I can just play g3 a lot of times. And just have the pawn defend itself. Uh, whereas before, if the king comes up and my king was like ranging on d5 or something, there'd be a double attack. That wouldn't be as appealing. Yeah, now the evaluation is almost plus two for white. Okay, so he plays king f5. I was getting low on the clock at this point. I played king f3. He played h5. Otherwise, g4 is coming. And that would be pretty bad for black. So I just waited with the king. Yeah, not sure it matters too much what I play here. So my strategy is just to wait and until I can get into e4. Yeah, and now when I get my king into e4 and his is back on f6 and I can play f5, it's just much better because I have f4 to work with. I can always shuffle my king back and forth between e4 and f4. That's probably the main reason this position is winning compared to um, this other one we were looking at where the kings were like this. Here, f5 was never a good idea because I, I don't have a waiting move with my king to keep defending the pawn on f5. Whereas in that other line, yeah, when we get up here, let's say black plays king f6 and I go king e4. Now if I play f5, just shuffle back and forth, black's going to eventually run out of pawn moves. Important distinction. So king e3, he played h4. I went back. He played b5. Yeah, and g4 check is important, I think. Very important. If he doesn't take en passant, if he goes back here, I can just walk over and go take this pawn. King h3, king takes h4. Um, I'm going to turn this off. My computer fan is going crazy <laughs> when Stockfish is running. So yeah, if he, if he doesn't take, I'm going to march over, take this, and I'm not worried about this situation over here. Black cannot force a pass pawn with the three versus the two. It's That's really important to know. Let's say c5 here. If b4, I can do what I did in the game, which is just take. And if takes, black's pawn... Extra pawn on b7 is totally discounted. If this happened, I'd want to react with b4. Very important. Lock up the structure. Not takes. If I take, then black has the option of playing b5, b4 and creating a pass pawn when that pawn gets deflected. Then I'd have to count and see if I could take and get back in time. But the structure as is, that's, that's important. I can either close it or do this and takes. 
Note here, if I play c4, there's extra stuff to calculate because there is this possibility. b5, take, here, black looking for a breakthrough. So going back, g4 check, he takes, I take. He plays c5. If he cuts inward, king e4, then I go here. Black's caught on the wrong side of the pawn. And if he goes after this, I am just too fast here. It's just not really close. He does have a bunch of pawns. You know, I still have to make sure I can corral these pawns, but this pawn's not nearly dangerous enough. Yep, so I'm going to add the engine back on here just to see if it's finally clarifying the evaluation. Still says, okay, now it's climbing. Yeah, it's at plus, plus six now. King f3, b4. Yeah, it looks like c4 and c takes b4 are winning here. I had about a minute left. I chose the one that looked less risky to me. Just again, like if this, I was a little leery about b5 possibilities later on. Um, he could try it now. But I think, yeah, if we follow this line, this should be winning. I can actually just bring my king over. And I'm within range to defend against this pawn advancing. I'm within the square of the pawn. And he can't he can't cope with both of these pawns. If takes, I can run this guy. They're too far apart. But that's a sharper line to calculate during the game. So I instead took and then shuffled with the king, king e3. Yeah, and I... This felt winning to me in the game, but I wasn't... The only thing I wasn't sure about was if we do this. I'm going to turn this off. If we do this. So I can push him like all the way back. We can get into a situation like this where if it was just purely king and pawn versus king, he would be drawing because he has the opposition. But I was thinking I can check. Essentially nearly stalemate him. Make him move the B pawn. And then make him move the b-pawn again. And then at this point, I will abandon my f-pawn. I'll abandon ship. Do this. And I think I win by a tempo. Yeah. This is winning. I'm too far in front of the pawn. So that's just an example line how this could play out. Maybe other ways to do that too. But that was the only thing I was thinking because keeping his pawn back makes it harder to win both of the pawns in an efficient manner. Uh, for instance, after king f6... I was saying king e4, but if I went king d4 instead and just outright did this, well, here it may not be as clear because I can go after his pawn, but he can go after my pawn too, like so. And if I try to advance my pawn in tandem with my king, he gets in behind. And yeah, I think this is a draw as well. King b6, king here. Mutually assured destruction. I could try b6, I guess. But then... You might run into a situation like this, where you actually lose as white. Black gets the last laugh, defends their pawn, and black will take this on the next move. And you're out of position with your king. But that's why in the game when black played b6, that, that wasn't favorable for black. He should try to keep his pawn back on b7 to make it as hard as possible for me, but it looks like it is winning. He did b6, I happily go here. He goes back, I go here. Now I think he realized that he shouldn't push b5. But still, I can do this. I think I think King D five also wins right away. But I just I wanted to force that pawn up to B five. I think this also wins though. Or should I do it this way? Probably this way. Yeah, because I can I can shoulder him and then come back and win the pawn. And if he tries to cut inward, yeah, I'm also in time. He's not gonna be able to do anything. So I think that also wins. But just push f5. Again, I was envisioning that situation where his king gets all the way back, but eventually he has to play b5, and I double back, and I win these pawns. So yeah, this all happens. And now I just decided to go for it, because he has to kind of come up the board to win the pawn, as opposed to just winning it on f7. Take. Yeah, and in such a position, my pawn being back is very nice. I have spare tempi if I need them. Even though he does duck in front of the pawn, it's no big deal. Um, note that if I play king a7, trying to deny him the b8 square, then he cuts upward, king c6, threatening to go king b5. I'd have to play king a6 and repeat the position. So don't be alarmed if you get in this situation where the king goes in front of the pawn. 
you have enough spare tempi and actually your king has reached the, the uh, key square, it doesn't matter anyways. So b5. Um, could also play king b6, king b6, king a8, king c7, king a7, b5 here. But in this case, you have to know the procedure playing king b6 uh, because if you play uh, b6, immediately it's stalemate. That's just one trick with these positions with a, with a knight pawn. So you'd have to play king b6, king here, king here, and then do kind of what I was showing in the game where this position, even though he has the opposition, it doesn't matter because he's going to get squeezed out in the corner. White will promote. That's just one of those positions you got to know. So as happened in the game, king b8, I played b5, he goes king a8, king here. Yeah, I could also play, I could also do this. I could have played this right away and squeezed him out. It would be the same thing. <laughs> I, guess, I guess the chess instructor in me was like, oh, this is a good example of showing the key square. The fact that you can like lose the opposition and still win. Um, so yeah, eventually winning this position. I guess he could make it difficult on me. He could play king a7. And if check here, king here. And this would be a draw, actually. So I'd have to repeat the procedure. I'd have to do this. Here, 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 here. <laughs> so. Yep, king c8. I play b6. Wait, now I'm confusing myself. King c6, king a7. Is this the... Can't tell where I am in the game. King c8. Yeah, if he plays king a7 here. Did I mess this up? No, okay. What I'd have to do. Yeah, yeah I'd have to go here, 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 I should say. Yeah, let me be clear about that. If you've watched this video to the end, thank you for one thing for uh, staying and watching this. But yeah, actually going to the C file is incorrect. I should have stayed on the A file. King a8 here, then do this and squeeze him out and promote the pawn. This is why it's good to brush up on your basic end games because I almost ended this video and didn't realize my mistake. So to sum this up, yeah, I, at no point was I letting the draw uh, slip into black's hands. But yeah, king b6 as I played in the game was totally unnecessary. I actually had the position where I'm squeezing the king out I should have just played b6 right away and then b7 and done this. Because I did it on the other side. I did it on the other side with king b6, king b8, king here. And he went king c8 and ended up losing. He gets squeezed out anyways. He could have tried king a7 though, based on that, that trick that I mentioned, like this. And that would have been a good, good try under the circumstances because I would have had to realize that I need to repeat bring the king back over here and squeeze him out again, get the same position. But I only had less than a minute left at this point, so I might have panicked and done something wrong. Okay, that's that's a good refresher for me because I haven't had this endgame for a while. It's like straight out of 100 endgames, you must know. So, okay, very interesting endgame with uh, the extra pawn. And essentially the extra pawn too when he took on f4. But also interesting that it actually was drawing for black, according to the engine. So long as he didn't make that trade, looks like he can still hold this position by just waiting with his king, letting my king come up. I still think, though, in a practical game, the clock running, rook e7 is you know, a committal and usually bad decision. He probably should not uh, look to play that way and instead look for activity. Okay, interesting game. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I'm going to put this in the standard category, even though this was technically a Blitz game 10 minute. But uh, thank you for watching, and I'll be back in again soon. Have a good week, guys. Bye.